So as Adam mentioned, we are, we just finished up Acts chapter 16 and Paul started on his second missionary journey, leaving from Antioch, going into the interior of Turkey, crossing over into Macedonia, which would be in Europe, kind of Northern Greece. And so that's where we left off and we'll pick it up in Acts chapter 17 and verse one. So we're partway through Paul's second missionary journey. And I like Acts chapter 17. It's got a lot of, 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 of uh, really uh, interesting, encouraging things in the story. There's a lot of action here. Paul has gone over from Asia into Europe and he's in Macedonia, Macedonia. Now, uh, being an inquisitive person, unfortunately, this, this throws me down into all kinds of strange. <laughs> and I was thinking, okay, where was ancient Macedonia? I know where Macedonia is today. Where was ancient Macedonia? And I didn't realize I had actually lived in ancient Macedonia without realizing. Okay? Yeah. So ancient Macedonia was a province in the Roman Empire. And it's the northern part of Greece mm -hmm. is, is kind of the heart of it. And that's where Paul is. But it also extends into Bulgaria, into what is today Macedonia, and all the way through Albania, where I lived for a few years. And there's a famous road that Paul probably traveled down when you look at the route that he took. It's called the, the Via Ignatia or the Ignatian Road. It's a very famous Roman, Roman road. So the Romans, this is how they kept everything together. And it went from what's today called Duris in Albania, where I've been. And it went from there to the east and into Macedonia. So this is when the Romans need to get their legions uh, mobilized and moving to the east. That's the way they went. So so it's uh, uh, so that's that's where ancient Macedonia was, which is not quite the same as modern Macedonia. So it's also you know, in First Corinthians where it talks about, or in, in Corinthians where it talks about the the Macedonians about how generous they were. And this, these are the people here in the region that we're talking. So Philippi is, is in Macedonia, where he was before. And then he goes on to, uh, to, to Thessalonica and to Berea. So that's all, that's all in Macedonia. And then he heads further south into Achaia or Achaia, which is, which is um, where most of Greece is today, Athens, Corinth, that area. So, so this is the area where we're looking at today, Macedonia in the north and Achaia in the south. So Acts chapter 17, I'm going to read verses 1 to 15. Now, when they had passed, the, there's the starting of Philippi. Now, when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Then Paul, as his custom was, went into them, and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, saying, this Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ. Mm -hmm. And some of them were persuaded, and a great multitude of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women joined Paul and Silas. But the Jews who were not persuaded became envious and took some of the evil men from the marketplace and gathered a mob, set all the city in an uproar, and attacked the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brethren to the rulers of the city, crying out, these who have turned the world upside down have come here too. Jason's harbored them, and these are all acting contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. And they troubled the crowd and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. So when they had taken security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. Verse 10, then the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. When they arrived, they went to the synagogue of the Jews. These were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness and search the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. Therefore, many of them believe, and also not a few of the Greeks, prominent women as well as men. But when the Jews from Thessalonica learned the word of God had pre was preached by Paul in Berea, they came there also and stirred up the crowds. Then immediately the brethren sent Paul away to go to the, spot, to go to the sea, 
but both Silas and Timothy remained there. So those who conducted Paul brought him to Athens and receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him with all speed, they departed. So this is, uh, so the gospel here is going, Paul's going to Thessalonica after he leaves Berea, and then he goes to Athens after that. So a few, a few things, just, so Paul goes to the synagogue on three Sabbaths and ends up converting uh, some Jews and several Greeks as well. However, the Jews become jealous. They incite a mob. The whole city is in uproar. And the Christians help Paul and Silas escape by night. They go to Berea. And then uh, Paul preaches. Uh, but when he gets to Berea, he preaches in the synagogue. And it says the Bereans were more fair-minded than the Thessalonians. And many believe. However, the Jews from Thessalonica hear about this and stir things up in Berea and Paul sent alone to Athens. That's basically, those are, the, those are the, the events that we're covering in this passage right here. Now, in Thessalonica, when, when Paul went to the city in Antioch in the first missionary journey in Acts chapter 13, we have a detailed sermon that Paul preaches. So we know what he said. We know what scriptures he quoted. Here in Thessalonica, we don't have that. It doesn't say what he actually told the people, just kind of a little brief summary. However, if we think about it, I think we can, we can get a good sense of what he actually did preach. So I think there are things we can learn from what Paul preached in Thessalonica. Uh, and so, so start with, start with in verse, verses two and three, in Acts 17, verses two and three, it then said, Paul, as his custom was, went to them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that Christ had to suffer and rise from the dead and saying this, Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ. So what did he do? He went to the synagogue. That was his pattern. We see this time and time again. He goes to the synagogue and he preaches to the Jews. And what does he preach? He preaches the prophecies of the Old Testament. He preaches that Jesus is the Christ. Well, what does that mean? Well, the Christ is referred to in the Old Testament, he says, he says, Jesus is the Christ. And it says he reasoned with them from the scripture. So this is how Paul presented the faith. He used the Old Testament to prove the faith. And he says he proved that Jesus was the Christ. They knew from the Old Testament that the Christ would come. And he explains how Jesus fulfilled the prophecies. So a few questions based on things that we've already covered in the first 15 chapters of the book of Acts. You can kind of a uh, little self, self quiz here. Where does it speak about the Christ, which simply means the anointed one in the Old Testament? So what would he have preached to say Jesus is the Christ? What scriptures would he have preached? Well, I think of um, Pisini Antioch, he, he quoted from Acts chapter 2, where it talks about, there's a famous prophecy about the Christ there, where it speaks about uh, why do the nations rage and the people plot vain things? The kings of the earth take their stand against the Lord and against his Christ. That's where, so that's a prophecy about the Christ for sure. There are other ones as well, but we know Paul preached that one in Pisidian Acts. So he's explaining he is the Christ. Now, where does it speak in the Old Testament? What would Paul have done? It says here he reasoned from the scriptures and, and was proving to them that the Christ had to be, had to suffer and be resurrected. So where does it say that the Christ would be rejected and would have to suffer? Well, what have we seen so far in the first 15 chapters of the book of Acts? When the apostles and the other early preachers are presenting the gospel, Acts chapter 2, which I just quoted, the kings of the earth take, take their stand against the Lord and against his, his anointed. That's from the apostles make that very point in Acts chapter 4, when they're talking about the, 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 the officials are opposed to them, they apply to themselves as well and against the Lord and against his Christ. When Philip is sharing the gospel with the Ethiopian eunuch, what is the Ethiopian eunuch reading? when Philip intercepts him on the chariot. He's reading from Isaiah 53, the, the suffering servant. And he, he starts with that scripture and he proclaims the Christ to him. So we see the, the, the Christians doing that in the beginning. Another place where it talks about the Christ would be rejected, would suffer, 
Stephen in Acts chapter 7, when he's giving his speech to the Sanhedrin, he makes the point, your forefathers rejected Moses, your forefathers rejected Joseph, and guess what? You're just like your forefathers. You just rejected and killed the Christ. So he's talking about they were foreshadowing. This is the pa same pattern that Christ followed here. So next question. This, is, this should be by now an easier one because we spent quite a bit of time on this. Where does it speak in the Old Testament about the Christ rising from the dead? What have we seen in the first 15 chapters of the book of Acts? We've seen this, this several different times. Well, Peter in Acts chapter 2, he quotes from Psalm 16, where uh, you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you let my body see decay. Peter quotes that in Acts chapter 2. And we know Hades. Uh, and, and Paul quotes it in, in Acts chapter 13 of the city of Antioch as and well. And we know Hades is a hell. Hades is uh, actually Hades is the place where the dead go awaiting final judgment. So he, he would go to, to so the Christ would go to Hades, but uh, but his body would not see decay. He will not remain in Hades. And then in Acts chapter two, Peter talks about the prophecies in Second Samuel chapter seven, First Chronicles 17 and and uh, in some of the Psalms. I'll put that in the notes regarding where it says that this, this that. The seed of David, the promised king who would come from David, it says that God would promise that he would raise up the Christ to sit on the throne. So that's that's uh, uh, from uh, 2 Samuel chapter 7, 1 Chronicles 17, the Psalms, and it's quoted by Peter and by Paul in Acts 2 and Acts, and Acts 13. Any more prophecies we've hit that says that the Christ would be raised up? Oh, oh, oh. The one about David, when they were like, when they said they were raised up a king like David. That's right. That's we just talked. We just talked about that one. Another one that we ran into is Deuteronomy 18 in Acts chapter three, where Peter says the Lord promised that He would raise up a prophet like Moses, and the point that He's making there is He just did raise him up. So He's He's, he's not only is a king descended from David, but He's also the prophet like Moses from uh, Deuteronomy 18. And then the last one that we covered regarding the resurrection, the most recent one is in Acts chapter 15. This is where James is explaining why the Gentiles could come to the faith. He said that was in fulfillment of a prophecy from Amos chapter nine, verses right. 11 and 12, that talked about the fallen down tent or tabernacle of David would be raised up would be rebuilt, restored, and then after that, the Gentiles would come to the faith. So he's saying, see, we've already seen the part one, now we're seeing part two, the Gentiles coming to faith. So he, that's how he makes the application. We talked about that when we were going through Acts 15. So several prophecies. So Paul is going, he's explaining to people, using the Old Testament prophecies, he's proving the faith based on the evidence of prophecies that were written hundreds of years before that Jesus has fulfilled. So Acts chapter 17, 7, there's another clue of what he was preaching from the criticism that he was getting. In Acts chapter 17, verse 7, Paul's opponents charged, they said, Jason has harbored them, and these are all acting contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying there is another king, Jesus. So what was Paul preaching? Jesus is the king over the kingdom of God. He's preaching a kingdom-focused message because they're saying, hey, wait a minute. He's saying that there's another king. This is, this is sedition. He's, he's, he's preaching that there's, we only have one king, Caesar, and he's saying that Jesus is a king. So it's a, the message of the kingdom of God. And we see, this, uh, we see this elsewhere in the book of Acts. The Paul is in Acts chapter 20 where he is speaking to the Ephesian elders. He says, you know, I was preaching the message of the kingdom. And, and the last chapter of Acts, in Acts chapter 28, was in, he's in Rome. It says there, in two different places, he's preaching the message of the kingdom of God. So what do we learn? He's preaching the message of the kingdom of God. Jesus says the king over the kingdom. And that Jesus 
suffered and died and was resurrected in fulfillment of the prophecy. So this is what I consider, this is the one, two, three knockout combination, you know, in, in, a, in a prize fight. But the fighters sometimes will have a combination. They'll hit, you, they'll hit you one place, send you back, and then they'll finish you off with a, with a blow to the head. Well, this is the one, two, three. This is the one, two, three knockout combination of the original gospel. Kingdom of God, Jesus died in fulfillment of the scriptures, and he rose again in fulfillment of the scriptures. At 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 to 4, when Paul says to the Christ, Christians in Corinth, well, this is the gospel I preach to you. That's what it is. So this is, this is the old gospel message. Now, I want to ask you a question. When you first heard the gospel, is that how it was presented to you? No. no. Okay. No. Were any of those things presented to you when you preached the gospel? Now, usually the gospel was presented as, and maybe some people, some people were, or parts of this, but the gospel is often presented as, it's an emotion-based appeal. Right. You know, you have a, 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 a hole in your heart and God's going God's gonna to fulfill that hole. Or you've got problems in your life, your life is a mess, your family's a mess, you're unhappy, and Jesus will bring you fulfillment and happiness in this life. And so it's, it's none of that. Right. And you can look at the life of the Apostle Paul. Nobody, he, there's no way he's getting chased out of town. He's getting persecuted. He's getting thrown in jail. He's getting stoned. All these things are happening to him. He's not preaching any anything remotely similar to that. He's preaching, no, this really happened. And he's willing to, to put his neck on the line and die for it. He's saying, this happened and I'll prove it to you from the scripture. So that's the old gospel message. And uh, so then I think what question was, was it, was it presented to you that way? And then the next question I have for you is, could you present the gospel like that to someone else? Do you know enough to do that? Okay. And uh, I mean, that's one of the reasons why we're going through the book of Acts to just show everybody this is what the apostles preached. And this is how they preached it. This is how they did it. So, and everything, every post, all the notes up there. So everything, I want to make everything available so that all of us can do exactly what they did and have the same effect that they did to preach the old gospel message, kingdom of God and fulfillment of the prophecies, proving the faith based on that. And I think it's a great way to present the gospel today. Okay, then, then there's a, there, so moving on then to, to Berea. So, so Paul, Paul leaves, it's too controversial, Paul and Silas have to leave, they flee at night, they go on to Berea, and then there's the famous line, I remember hearing this for so many years, the good-hearted Bereans, I learned it, I learned it in the NIV, but I'll, I'll read it from, from the, 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 uh, the New King James, verses 10 and 11, it says, the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea, when they arrived, they went to the synagogue of the Jews, these were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. And I remember, as uh, you know, back back in my twenties, someone telling me, you know, you need to have the heart of a Berean, so you need to read your Bible every day. That's what they were. That's, that was not kind of the point. That you need to read your Bible every day to see be good-hearted person like the Bereans. And I learned it in the uh, in the New American Standard. It says in the, in the New King James, it says they were more fair-minded. The, the New American Standard says these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica. And the NIV, which I, which I learned it in originally, now the Bereans were a more noble character than those in Thessalonica. So noble character, noble-minded, fair-minded, you know, all, you, get the, you get the picture of what he's talking about. So these are, these are better-hearted people. Okay, than the people of Thessalonica. So I, I guess I always thought, well, uh, well for, first question, what were the Bereans doing yeah. here? Because I think this was, with all good intentions, I think, honestly, this scripture was a bit misapplied. What the Bereans were doing is Paul is explaining, using the Old Testament prophecies, that Jesus is the Christ, suffered and died and was resurrected on the third day using the prophecies to prove it and what are the bereans doing they're listening they're they're eager to, to learn but they don't just swallow it they don't just believe it what they do is they go back and check out the scriptures to see if what he said was right so 
He's quoting the Old Testament prophecies. They're listening to him. And then they go back and they look at the scriptures themselves. So somehow they had access to a copy of the scriptures. They go back and they look at the scriptures themselves. They read what he was, what he's talking about and say, all right, is what he's saying, does this line up? Is he telling the truth? Is this what the scriptures say? Does this all fit? So they're taking the time to go back and read it. And they're doing this, this every day. So question is, what is God looking for here? What's being held up? What's God looking for? Uh, what I appreciate about the Bereans, they're truth seekers. Mm -hmm. They're truth seekers. They want to, Paul tells them something and they want to check it out. Is what he's saying true or not? Uh, you know, John 8, 31, 32 passes we're familiar with. It said, Jesus said, if you hold my teachings, you're really my disciples, then you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. Was a, one of the Proverbs says, buy the truth and do not sell it. So this is, this is their truth seekers. I mean, I'm always looking, when I'm sharing my faith, I'm looking for truth seekers. I'll, I'll ask people when I share my faith, I'll say, if I could prove to you with solid evidence beyond a reasonable doubt, which is, and I can do this because Paul did the same thing, just do the same thing he did. If I can prove it to you with the evidence of fulfilled prophecies written hundreds of years before Jesus was born, that he was the Christ, the son of God, rose from the dead, would you repent of your sins and become a Christian? That's how I share my faith with people, okay? That's not how, you know, I, I, that's not how I used to share my faith, but for many years, that's what I'll, that's what I'll do. I say, I want to find out, are you a truth seeker? Mm. And some people will say, well, if you could prove it, like, like they're convinced I can't possibly because they think, well, faith is something ethereal. It's a gift of God. You have it or you don't. It's some feeling. So no, I can prove it to you just like Paul did to, to the people in Thessalonica. If you can prove, if I say, if I can prove it to you, would you become a Christian? And that puts people on the spot because I'm shining the light to ask the question, are you a truth seeker? Are you a faker? What are you? Okay, if you're a truth seeker, the only answer is, well, of course, if you could prove it, then I become a Christian. Okay, if somebody is a faker, they just want to sit around and talk religion. Right. Then they're going to say, "Well, no, I, 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 I still wouldn't do that. I just like to, I'd like to spend time with you. I like to learn a little more and gain some more knowledge, but I don't actually want to repent of my sins, right?" You know, a lot of people have the idea, and it's a terrible idea, that to be to, to becoming a Christian means you just believe whatever somebody tells you, okay. And you just, you just accept it. You just trust. You trust that whatever, whatever the leaders are telling you is, must be from God because, after all, this is such a wonderful church and we're all such wonderful people. And so questioning, questioning things is considered to be bad. And I appreciate the Bereans. What I see here is they're questioning. They want to know the truth, but they're questioning. They're searching. It's okay to be skeptical. It's okay to ask questions, right? But they're not just asking questions and being skeptical. They're doing the work and doing the digging to find the answers to the questions. I, th I think of this, this passage a lot. Jesus said, when Jesus asked, what's the greatest commandment? Uh, Mark chapter 12, 28, 29, he says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. Okay. When God created all the people of the world, he gave every single person their own mind. Okay. I don't want anybody controlling my mind. I don't want to control anybody else's mind either. We all have our own minds. God gave us a mind. So the question is, what are you doing with it? Are you like the Bereans? Are you a truth seeker? And are, you know, some people, some people have questions, but they're lazy. They're, they have questions. They have good questions, but they're willing to do the work to find the answers. And they're willing to go to the right place to find the answers. So that, that's the challenge. God gave us a mind. He expects us to use it. He wants to, what does it mean to love God with your whole mind? Okay. What does that mean? You can't delegate your thinking to other people. You can't delegate it to church leaders. Don't even think of delegating it to me. All right? The reason why, 
the reason why after we teach the lessons, we post the notes and usually there's about 12 pages of detailed notes for all descriptions and everything else. We post this on, on the website, 15, 15 pages. Dave, Dave is my editor here. So I was trying to make it a little more palatable. So uh, we go over the notes, David and I several times and we put it all up there because we don't want anybody to just believe what I'm saying because Maybe, maybe they think I'm persuasive or I know what I'm talking about. I want to back everything up, provide the receipts here. So you can go back, check these things out. You don't have to trust my word for it. And because and I think that that's the kind of people I think God appreciates. And I want to really encourage that spirit in the fellowship of the church here. Let's use our minds. You know, there are lots of warnings in the scripture that false teachers and false prophets are going to come into the church. The scriptures are, everybody thinks, oh, that's, that's, the, that's the church down the road. They're not talking about our church. No, they're, Peter and Paul said, no, it's going to come into this church. <laughs> it's going to happen. So what do they tell you to do? Well, first of all, you say you need to have mature people who, who can, can mind the store in the church. But they also say in 2 Timothy 3 and in 2 Peter 1, they also say, you need to pay attention to the scriptures. You need to be immersed in the word of God. You need to know the word. of There is no substitute for that. You can't just find a nice church and put your mind in cruise control. Okay, You can't do that. You need to, for the sake of your, your own salvation, your, your children, your family, for the whole church, we all need to be in the word of God and, and questioning things, checking things out, including anything that comes out of my mouth. Don't believe it without checking it out. Uh, church needs that. People who have the courage to ask the questions, find the answers, and then and then push back respectfully. So I'm, if I'm teaching something you believe is, is incorrect, you know, respectfully, let us push back on that. We, we appreciate that. Uh, Psalm 1, this, this spirit that, that is really held up in the scriptures. Yeah. First three verses of Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the troublesome. But his will is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. Amen. He shall be like a tree planted by streams of waters that produces its fruit in its season. His leaf shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. So I really, really want to encourage everybody have the heart of a Berean, question, dig, and, and, and have the heart that's held up in Psalm 1 of someone who's immersed in the word of God day and night. There's no shortcut for that. That's going to build the strongest possible uh, church and you know, prepare us for whatever Satan throws at us. And also, to me, the, what, what, what goes on here in Thessalonica, it has implications for my own evangelist. I want to look for people in Berea. I want to look for people that have the heart of the Bereans, that they're, they're people who I'm going to challenge them to check out the scriptures. I'll present the prophecies. I'll present the evidence for what the Christian faith holds out, for what the apostles taught, and then challenge them to be like the Bereans to check these things out, to take the time to do that. And to be a truth seeker, don't just either reject the gospel out of hand and don't even accept it just because it sounds good or produces a good feeling. But ask questions and dig and build your faith on the unshakable foundation. Check it out like the Bereans did. Uh, and I want to want to throw a question out there that I wrestle with this last week as I'm looking at this passage for years it said you know the bereans were of more noble character or fair more fair-minded than the, the thessalonians i thought well the bereans are the good guys the thessalonians are the losers here okay <laughs> so, I got, that's, it's kind of a put down on on the people of, of thessalonica because you're saying well these guys are really good not like these other guys over here and so i was wondering what was the church in Thessalonica like? It seems like kind of a mild put down here. And, and so, yeah, I wonder what was the church in Thessalonica like? It doesn't say that much here. So how do we learn what the church in Thessalonica is like? Well, Paul wrote two letters 
to the church in Thessalonica. So by reading those letters, you read this, and then you read the letters and put the pieces together for this. So I took a look. So I need to stop and go back and read, read Thess Thessalonians, at least starting with 1 Thessalonians, especially because after spending time in Thessalonica and in Berea, Paul goes down to Athens. Yeah. And what happens when he's in Athens, he's down, he's sent there by himself. So he, he, he leaves Berea. He's, he's too controversial. He, he sails down to Achaia down south. He goes to Athens. So he's there alone for the next part of the story here. And he does something rather significant while he's in Athens that most people think about. Don't think about it. He wrote a letter. He wrote a letter, 1 Thessalonians, while he's in Athens on his second missionary journey. If you read, if you read the story, you can put the pieces together, and it's pretty obvious that that's that that is that is what he did. So uh, this first Thessalonians is, is generally considered to be the first part of the New Testament that was written. So after he goes to Athens, he then goes on to Corinth and he has an interaction with Gallio, who is the proconsul of Achaia. And we know from the Roman historical records, they keep track of the proconsuls and the governors and the Caesars, that Gallio was, was uh, le leading uh, in that position in, in Achaia in the years 50 and 51. So you can pretty much figure out that 1 Thessalonians, the first part of the New Testament, most likely that was written, I don't know when the gospels were, were written, were first written down, but that'd be written around the year 50 AD. Now, Jesus, if he died in 33, that's 17 years later. That's not a long time. So we have the first part of the New Testament written down after that time. Now, Luke is recording these events based on what Paul is telling him. But obviously, he's, you know, the story isn't written until after Paul ends up in Rome in, in the book of Acts. We're reading it. So, uh, so, so this is so so first Thessalonians. So Paul, after he leaves Berea, he goes down to, to Athens. And he writes a letter back to the church in Thessalonica. So this is fairly soon after he left the church. And so the things he's describing about the church in Thessalonica give a pretty good picture of what Paul left behind, of what that church was like. And so he's down there and Gallio kind of just warns him. Well, well, we'll get to that. That's in Corinth. So we're not there quite yet. First Thessalonians chapter one. Let's turn there. I encourage you to, to read along. I'll read a few passages. To give me a much different appreciation of, you know, I, I read First Thessalonians and I'm, I'm looking at certain specific issues, but instead of reading it in context with it, alongside of what it talks about in the book of Acts and Acts 17. First uh, Thessalonians chapter one, Paul says to the church of Thessalonians, of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Father, Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, labor of love, patience of hope in the Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of our God and Father, knowing, beloved brethren, your election by God. For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but in power and the Holy Spirit with much assurance as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. And you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit. So you became examples to all in Macedonia and Achaia who believe. For from you, the word of the Lord has sounded forth, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. Your faith toward God has gone out so we don't need to say anything. I mean, wow, that sounds like a pretty impressive church. Okay. He says, he says, your faith has gone out everywhere. You're you're evangelizing Macedonia and Achaia. And the other thing I'm thinking is, Paul, it sounds like he was there for a lot more than three weeks. So, <laughs> so it mentions that he reasoned in the synagogue for three weeks. It doesn't say that he stayed there for three weeks. So I'm just, it sounds like he was there for quite a while. He knew the people built quite a foundation. He had very impressive things to say about them. Chapter two and verse one, you yourselves know, brethren, 
our coming to you was not in vain, but even after we had suffered before and were spitefully treated in Philippi, as you know, we were bold in our God to speak to you the gospel of God in much conflict. For our exhortation did not come from error or uncleanness, nor was it uh, from deceit. So he, Paul is telling it. Paul said he told him the story of what happened when he was in Philippi in Acts chapter 16, right before he went there. He said, you know what, you know what happened when I was in Philippi, the, the, the horrible treatment we received there. Chapter 2 and verse 7. This is beautiful. It's, it, 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 Paul's affection towards the people in the church in Thessalonica. But we were gentle among you, just as a nursing mother cherishes her own children. So affectionately longing for you, we are well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you become dear to us. You remember, brethren, our labor and toil for laboring night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you, we preach to you the gospel of God. Your witnesses and God also how devoutly and justly and blamelessly we behaved ourselves among you who believe. As you know, we exhorted, comforted, and charged every one of you as a father does his own children, that you would walk worthy of the kingdom of God who calls you into his own kingdom. It's a beautiful picture here where he says, you know, I, I, we, I had the affection of you as a nursing mother does for her baby, as a child, as a, as a father does for his own children. So, and then Paul goes on later and he says, you know, I kept trying to come back to visit you. He says, but Satan blocked me. But think about that. Paul on his, on his second missionary journey, he wanted to go into, into parts of, of Asia Minor. He says, the Holy Spirit blocked me. And here he says, he wanted to go back there. Satan blocks him. So he, he's getting blocked by <laughs> Satan, the Holy Spirit. There's things going on in the spiritual realm. I don't know how he knows which one is blocking him, but somehow he knew that he, knew that he was. So, um, And then later on in, in 1 Thessalonians, he's talking about the second coming of Jesus and eternal judgment. So I, I think he's, he's he's admonishing them to stay on the on the path to be living in the fear of God in in the face of, of the second coming and eternal judgment to come. So uh, there's some wonderful things. There's no put down of the Thessalonians yeah. here. Okay, they're not they're not. I think it's inferior. The the the, the Bereans had there were more people in Berea who were receptive to the gospel than they were in Thessalonica. So he said, I think he's speaking as a group that the Bereans had a more noble character as far as, as far as the city. But the church in Thessalonica was was wonderful. And Paul loved them, held them up, and and is extolling how wonderful they are to all people. You know, it talks about the the churches in Macedonia in, in Corinthians who were so generous and gave to other people. Well, Thessalonica is, that's, that's the biggest church in Macedonia, so, uh, uh, in, in that region. So, anyway, it's a good idea when you're reading Acts chapter 17 to read First and Thess Second Thessalonians or the same way. You read First and Second, Second Thessalonians to go back and read Acts chapter 17 and put the pieces together to get a more accurate picture. Let's take a look at what happens when he goes to Athens. Acts chapter 17, start reading in verse 16. Now, while Paul waited for them in Athens, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw the city was given over to idols. Therefore, he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshipers and in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. Then certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered him. And some said, what does this babbler want to say? Others said he seems to be proclaiming foreign gods because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus saying, may, may we know what this new doctrine is of which you speak? For you're bringing some strange things to our ears. Therefore, we want to know what these things mean. For all the Athenians and the foreigners who were there spent their time in nothing but either to tell or hear some new thing. Then Paul stood up in the midst of the Areopagus and said, men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. So this, is start, this is the famous Paul sermon on Mars Hill. Okay. Verse 23, for as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription 
to the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing him, I proclaim to you. God who made the world and everything in it, since he's the Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshiped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life and breath and all things. And he's made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwelling. So they should seek the Lord in the hope they might grope for him and find him, though he's not far from each of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as also some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Therefore, since we are offspring of God, we ought not to think the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone or something shaped by the art of man's devising. Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked while others said, we'll hear you again on this matter. So Paul departed from among them. However, some men joined him and believed among them Dionysius the Areopagite, a woman named Damaris, and others with them. So this is uh, Paul's in Athens. He's alone. He is distressed to see that the city of, is full of idols. He preaches in the synagogue as he usually does, but he's also in the marketplace encountering the Greek philosophers there, the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers. He's invited to preach at the Areopagus. So the Areopagus means, it means the hill of Ares or the hill of Mars. Mars Hill. So you hear, you hear the expression Mars Hill, Areopagus, same thing, two different languages. This is where the great philosophical discussions would take place in Paul's day, and also the place where an official council or court would meet, called, which is called the Areopagus, named after the place where they meet. And so the response that he gets is some people mock him when he's talking about the resurrection of the dead, but others people are more, more interested and they end up becoming Christians. So I, I, there's, I think there's a lot to learn in Paul's approach here. So for, first question for you. So he is in Athens. I don't know if you ever heard the expression, the Athens of America. What city is that? The Athens of America, what city had, what was called that historically in America's past. Now, being here in Massachusetts, the obvious answer is Greece. Boston. Boston. Okay, there you go. <laughs> wow. In the in the early 1800s, Boston was known as the Athens of America, and I think wow. the reason why it was the Athens of America is because this is where the place where the the, the radical political ideas permeated from, which then spread throughout the rest of the country. Now, of course, people in Philadelphia will dispute with people from Boston and say, no, their, their city is the Athens of America. But Boston used to be called that. People call the Athens of America also today sometimes because of all the educational establishments, the well-known colleges that are here in Boston. So this is, it's a place of intellectuals. It's a place of philosophers. And Athens historically was, was, a, was the, the, the birthplace of a lot of different philosophical schools. So, all right, think about if we're in the Athens of America, maybe there's something for us to learn from how he presented the gospel there. Maybe, okay? So in terms of how do we present the gospel to a relatively godless pagan society in which we find ourselves? So I, so I want to notice some things about the strategy that Paul used. This is a different audience. He's not preaching in the synagogue. He's preaching to people that have that are pagans that believe in all different gods. And here's the approach that he takes. Uh, the first thing he does that I notice, he builds a bridge. He holds his nose and builds a bridge to his audience. Okay, so he's. It says he's wandering around the city and he's he's a Jew and he is disgusted. He is annoyed. He's provoked by all the idolatry that's filling the city. And yet he, he keeps that under control and he says, well, 
I want, I, I have to hand it to you people. You're very religious. Okay. He's, he finds something to compliment them on that he can say, well, at least you're very religious. All right. Uh, and then he finds, he continues that, and he finds a creative way to talk about God. Well, he says, you know, I was wandering around the city. I see idols too, you know, all different idols, and different gods, different statues. But there was one, I guess people are just hedging their bets. There was one idol there, the one altar, which was devoted to the unknowing God, an unknown God. So just in case we didn't, in case we didn't hit them all and we're offending somebody, we have an altar to an unknown God. He says, that's the one, the unknown God I'm going to tell you about. So beautiful way of, of presenting the gospel he uses a natural launching point of the altar to the unknown God to say, I'm going to tell you about that one. The unknown God. This is the one you don't know. He's the one who created all things. He's the one who created all people. All the nations of the earth came from one blood. They all came from someone created by him. And then he's speaking to a philosophical group and he answers right off the bat one of the greatest philosophical questions of all time. Why are we here? What are we here for? And he answers the question. He gives them the answer right up, right up front. He, he throws them. He throws them a little meat, a little something to chew on. He says, "Guess what? God made us all. He put us all here, and He put us here for a reason that we might seek Him and find Him, for He's not far Amen. from any of us." He says, "That's what we're here for, guys." We're not here to maximize. We're not, this is not Epicurean philosophy. We're not here to maximize our pleasure in life. We're here to seek God. He put us here, and we're here to seek him. So he, he uses that to advance the gospel, challenge them. And he even quotes some of their own pro prophets. He says, you know, we are his offspring, as some of your own prophets have said. So he uses, he uses their culture to, to do that. And then after he's got them nice, nice and softened up, <laughs> then he goes and he drops the hammer, right? He, he, then he drops the hammer and he says, you know, God put up with all this idolatry for a period of time. But now he commands all men everywhere to repent. So he basically goes after them for their idolatry after after buttering them up in the beginning of, of the message here and building a bridge. And he then he drops the atomic bomb on. Them. He says, God's had it. The creator of the universe who made all of us, we're here to seek him. And he, he has had it with idolatry. He's not going to put up with it anymore. He commands all men everywhere to repent. So Paul doesn't waste a lot of time beating around the bush to talk about sin, to talk about the real issue. When Jesus was preaching in the beginning, just like John the Baptist, the message was repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. When we're preaching the gospel, we need to let people know you've got to repent of your sins. This is part of the message. And Paul did the same thing. So you need to repent of your idolatry. God's not going to put up with it anymore. And you're going to face judgment. He's preaching repentance and judgment. That one day he's appointed the man who's going to judge every person. And he's confirmed this by raising him from this. So he's preaching the resurrection of Jesus. This whole idea of people who are, who are dead and buried and their bodies are decaying are going to come back to life someday. Just really is, is a hard one for the philosophers, the intellectuals to buy into. So wait a minute. People die, bury their bodies, their bodies rot. And you're telling me they're going to be bodily resurrected. You've got to be kidding me. You're nuts. This is, this is, a, this is a ridiculous philosophy. And they just rejected it out of hand. The teaching about the resurrection of the dead was what, was what got him in trouble with the philosophers that they, they said, this, this is, this is, this is too far. This is too, too far out there. You know, for, for many years, somehow or other, uh, maybe it's Protestant influence. I don't know what it is, but somehow or other, I had the, I had the idea when you become a Christian, you die, you go straight to heaven. And, and, and then I was reading the early Christians, and they're talking about the body is going to be physically raised from the dead. And I, and I go back and look at the scriptures, 
In John chapter 5, 28, 29, this is exactly what Jesus said. The time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out and, and, and be judged and face, face eternal judgment. So Jesus talked about that in John chapter 5. 1 Corinthians 15, an entire chapter is devoted to the resurrection of the dead. Now, now guess what? He's, 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 he's devoting that to the church in Corinth, which is also in Achaia. It's also a you know, Greek, heavily Greek culture where people are struggling with this idea of, of the resurrection. But uh, that's foundational Christian teaching. I mean, you go back and look at Hebrews chapter, chapter 6, the, the elementary teachings of the faith. And resurrection of the dead, for some reason, I had missed it, but resurrection, of the, let's, let's take a look there. Hebrews chapter 6. I mean, one thing we want to make sure we get right is the elementary teaching. Let's start with that. Let's get that right first, all right? Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews right says, therefore, verse 1, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let's go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation. Okay, this was the foundation of repentance from dead works okay faith toward god the doctrine of baptisms the laying on of hands the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgments okay those are the elementary teachings of the faith and i was a christian for years before i, I totally missed one of them so repentance faith baptism okay i was i was i got a pretty good foundation on that but this is one of them as well, eternal judgment. And if you just look at what we've read so far in Acts chapter 17, I mean, this, this, is, this is what we've been reading. This is what was preached. All these things were preached, faith, repentance. Uh, you know, we've seen throughout the book of Acts, it's an emphasis on baptism and then eternal judgment and the resurrection of the dead. He's, he's speaking to, to, about that to the, uh, the people in Athens. So, uh, so the outcome of his teaching was many people uh, became Christians. Well, at least some people, so many people, may, I'm sorry, many people mocked what he was saying because he was teaching the resurrection of the dead. But some people wanted to hear more and believe And even a man who's re referred to as Dionysius the Areopagite. So he's a member of the Areopagus, obviously a prominent, prominent person. So the gospel bears fruit even in a strongly pagan, worldly society like that. So we just had to preach the gospel. So um, I'm going to hold off on his uh, time in Corinth to the next time we get together. We'll stop there for today. Thank you.